Welcome to Donockmore Workhouse. Here you can discover the story behind the Great Famine that devastated Ireland in the middle of the 19th century. The blight epidemic of 1845 to 1847 was the culmination of a long series of crop failures. There had been 30 famines of greater or lesser severity over the previous century. Tenant farmers had little land to support their families and had become increasingly dependent on the potato due to its large yields and high nutritional value. By 1845, more than one-third of all agricultural land in Ireland was used to grow potatoes, including the previously unproductive uplands of County Leash, where the influential land agent William Stewart Trench took a lease on lands at Bonray in the foothills of the Sleeve Blue Mountains and produced enormous quantities of crops. Potato blight disease spread from the eastern seaboard of the United States to Western Europe in the early 1840s. Ireland's damp, mild climate provided the perfect conditions for the disease. The scene was set for one of the most devastating catastrophes in world history. I happen to recall precisely the day, almost to the hour, when the blight fell on the potatoes. A party of us were driving to a seven o'clock dinner. As we passed a remarkably fine field of potatoes in blossom, the scent came through the open windows of the carriage, and we remarked to each other, how splendid the crop. Three or four hours later, as we returned home in the dark, a dreadful smell came from the same field, and we exclaimed, something has happened to these potatoes. Denied their main food source and weakened through hunger and starvation, disease exacted a dreadful toll on the poor of Ireland. Many thousands died in the bitter winter of 1846 to 1847. Workhouses were established under the Irish Poor Law Act to serve as the last refuge for desperate people. The state made every effort to ensure that entering the workhouse was the last possible option for the impoverished. When the famine uh, struck and the potato crop, which was the main staple diet of these poor people, that took their food uh, away from them. And if one of the, the men or the people within the household got injured, they weren't able to work. That meant that they were kicked out and maybe another farmer got their little holding. So the workhouse was really the only refuge that people had. But that refuge had a stigma attached to it. You were seen as the poor of the poor because the workhouse was a place of last resort. Life in the workhouse was strictly regulated and whole families were separated when they entered. It was a very regimented system. Everything was accounted for. That was part of the whole ethos of the workhouse is that everybody there was working and that what they were given in, in return was uh, controlled. If you were a family here that were looking to, for refuge within the workhouse, uh, and you come in the long avenue into the probationary room. Until the following morning when the local doctor doing his rounds would come and check any new entrance out. If they were well, their clothes were taken from them, they were scrubbed and scoured, and then they were given a uniform. And from there, they were separated into four distinct groups. The men went to one section, uh, women went to another. Um, children under two were allowed to stay with the mothers, but the other children were all removed. Um, and again, boys and girls were, in most cases, um, separated. A mother, if she had privileges, and that was a sort of reward system maybe for being good, uh, could actually get a supervised visit for one hour a week with her children. One reason why they needed the breakdown was to uh, plan for their dietary needs. 
if you were able-bodied, you were therefore expected to work, therefore needed uh, more nourishment, uh, whereas the infirm were given less. Behind the statistics, individual stories told tales of tragedy, desperation and humiliation. Late one evening, a vulnerable young man named John Byrne soiled himself in the workhouse. The master, who was the person that was in charge of the day-to-day -day management place, instructed the porter and the caretaker to take him down to the local river to wash him and clean him and bring him back. But when they brought him back, they didn't give him a fresh set of clothes. And within two or three days, John Byrne died of pneumonia. Now, this case was investigated by the Poor Law Commission. However, the Commission found that there was no case to answer and promptly closed the matter. The circumstances and conditions of John Byrne's tragic life and death were not uncommon in Ireland's workhouses. Life slowly and painfully began to change for the people of rural Ireland in the aftermath of the famine. For some, emigration was the only escape, and over a million people fled Ireland's shores to establish new lives elsewhere. In Ireland, changes in land ownership, agricultural practice and new machinery helped to increase farm yields. With the establishment of the first dairy farming cooperatives in Ireland, farmers could now work together to build large collaborative creameries to ensure they could get the best price for their produce. In 1927, a creamery was established on the site of the old workhouse. By the following year, it was producing over 400,000 gallons of milk. In recent decades, local people have come together to keep the story of Donnock Moor alive from its foundation as a workhouse to its time as a creamery. Their mission statement actually is to ensure that the story of Donnick Moor is not forgotten. People can now come today and see uh, what it was like because the structures are still there and then we're there to tell the story. It's far the law a dog a maslon, a gillon in your skate. Jimmy me har sole, smiany jig, smiany jig. Heal me you come out and wear a jig of what again. Nave gushiri maru soji. Er <laughs> Could well sell ye can me egg shall lose ye and I agree near at war ye in ye scare.